Hi folks, good morning. Sorry I'm, I'm a bit late, but uh, here we are in lockdown uh, again. Um, we're going through Acts that we've just started. So last week I touched on the, the opening verses of Acts, mentioned that uh, Luke's style and purpose in writing both his gospel and then the sequel, Acts, was more instructional in the case of his gospel and historic in the case of Acts um, rather than theological in either work. So what do I mean by that? Uh, in a nutshell, Luke never met Jesus, never heard him preach or teach firsthand. So he relied entirely on eyewitness accounts from those who had met and heard Jesus in the flesh. Luke was trained as a physician and so was meticulous in his research and the collection of the facts of the life and teaching of Jesus Christ and the birth and growth of the early church. His gospel ends up being the longest in volume of words and the inclusion of some events that do not appear in the other three gospels allowing that the Gospel of John was probably written after Luke anyway. But uh, Matthew and Mark, uh, there are two notables that are not included in Matthew and Mark. Um, and they are the discourse with the thief on the cross um, in, the other two, in the other two Gospels, or are both, both thieves um, are abusing him. But in Luke, one thief repents and you get that lovely um, pronouncement from Jesus I tell you the truth today you will be with me in paradise and after the resurrection the story concerning the two disciples returning to Emmaus Luke is the only one who reports that event so there must have been many many more events that Luke had recorded uh, they weren't in in his gospel, they weren't in any of the gospels, but um, definitely Luke. Luke was a a meticulous um, scribe. Luke made the point of keeping himself neutral as far as the facts were concerned. He let Jesus speak for himself through eyewitnesses, and of course, the words of Jesus would have been those that had been handed down. And in the book of Acts, as we will see as we open it up week by week, is a faithful rendition of the continuing spread of the growth of the Christian church and the exploits of his companion, Saul, later to become Paul. It's widely accepted that Luke was a Syrian from Antioch, highly educated, hence his fluency in Greek. He became a devout and dedicated Christian over a lifetime serving and preaching the gospel with Paul on, on at least two of his missionary journeys. He never married, had no children and died at age 85 after a very fruitful life. So that leads us into today's passage. That's enough history for the day. We left the disciples uh, taking their last look at Jesus as he prepared to leave them and getting their last instructions on how and where to spread his word, the good news, the gospel. So the passage says this, verse 9, After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as, as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. So after Jesus utters his last words to the eleven, he's taken up as though the Father is saying, your time on earth is now finished, I'm calling you back. My spirit has taken you from your earthly mission. The cloud is symbolic, probably, 
A cloud hid Moses, Elijah and Jesus during the transfiguration. Scripture is not given, giving us a lesson on the location of heaven, nor is it delving into cosmology or physics. It is simply using the only way out as up. Uh, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. Whatever the, uh, whatever the, the physics or the physical aspect of Jesus leaving them, he was leaving them for the last time. And they were probably very conscious of this moment of finality, this time of aloneness. You can imagine them thinking to themselves, what do we do now? Who do we have to turn to? How will we manage? After three years of ministry, teaching, healing and fellowship together, it's all over. And then, and we go back to the scripture, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Two men dressed in white? Angels. You do believe in angels, don't you? I certainly do. And looking back over my life, I can say with certainty that angels have been involved in my rescue from evil influences. And look, look what it says in Hebrews 13. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Yes, I have no doubt that there are angels everywhere. The angels appeared also to Mary and the women at the tomb on resurrection morning and on other occasions, dressed in white. The colour white symbolises purity and joy. The angels said in verse 11, Men of Galilee, they said. Men of Galilee. This statement is made possible because Judas Iscariot is no longer with them. He was the only outsider. It can be assumed that the remaining 11 disciples were all recruited in the early days of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. The angel is reminding them of their early days of ministry when they were all recruited by the Master who changed all their lives for the better. Cherish this fellowship, the angel is implying. Stick together and nurture one another. And then uh, they say, why do you stand there looking into the sky? For now he's gone. So it's pretty pointless standing here <laughs> staring at the empty sky. He's not going to come back. And to finish up, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus has already told them that he will be returning at the appointed time. He doesn't know, we don't know. He said it's only the Father who knows. But until then, do what he says, go back to Jerusalem and wait. Jesus has fulfilled his mission. He has taught, suffered and died, been raised from the dead, defeating death in the process. And importantly for us, is now our intercessor in heaven to God the Father. When we pray, we are praying to the living God, the Saviour Jesus Christ, the promised one of Israel, Emmanuel, God with us. We are so blessed. What can we say but thank you, Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for loving us. And as we come into Easter um, in a few days, thank you for caring enough to sacrifice, make the ultimate sacrifice so that we can be cleansed and come before you. There's nothing else for us to say, but thank you. Help us, Lord, to, to honour that sacrifice. Help us to be ministers of hope. And as you have blessed us, uh, in, in these uncertain days, we all, we all need to, to bless one another, to be kind to one another, to nurture one another. So, Lord, thank you as you have blessed us. Help us to bless others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, oh, look at that behind me. See my orchids? Hmm. 
They're beautiful. God's creation. Anyway, folks, have a great day. Uh, PJ will be on tomorrow. Andrew was on yesterday. He was a bit late, but he was on just the same. And we'll see you in church on, uh, oh, that's (laughs) COVID allowing. If all things go according to Hoyle, we'll be We'll be out of prison at five o'clock on on Thursday night and we'll see you Friday morning. God bless. Bye for now.